Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Cherry Audio Mercury 6 tutorial series. I'm going to have a look at a couple of sections today. I've got the envelopes to have a look at, including an examination of the amplifier, the voltage controlled amplifier. We're also going to take a look at the VCF, which stands for voltage controlled filter. If you're enjoying this series so far and you want to help support my channel, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. Awesome way to do that. Let's have a look at the envelopes first. An envelope is simply a thing that describes a shape and that shape is used to apply a modulation somewhere in the system. The most common form of envelope is the one attached to the amplifier, such that when I press a key on the keyboard, you're going to hear, hear a sound and you're going to carry on hearing that sound more often than not until I let the key go and then the sound will disappear. That effect's generated from an envelope and in the Mercury, it's generated from envelope two. The voltage controlled amplifier is the thing that makes sound. In the, in the physical world, the amplifier is the thing that takes the tiny little electronic signal that's been passing through the synthesizer and makes it big enough to power speakers. In the digital world, that effect's obscured a little, but nevertheless, the circuitry is still there. It has to be emulated in the same way. And the VCA um, is controlled exclusively from envelope two. There's a hardwired connection from the second envelope into the amplifier. And the amount by which the envelope can control the volume of the synthesizer is controlled by this level slider here. In other words, if I turn that slider all the way down and press some keys, you can just about hear it. It's extremely quiet. So it's not zero volume, but it's effectively zero. As I turn this level up, that's what's allowing us to hear the sound. Now, the reason why you can hear the sound at all, when I hold the key down, you hear that constant level. That's called the sustain level, and that's one of the, the nodes of an envelope. S stands for sustain, and as you can see at the moment, sustain is turned all the way up to maximum. Basically means as long as you want this thing to happen, it's gonna happen as loud as the synthesizer can possibly do. Another way of thinking about that is that if I press this key down and turn sustain down, that's effectively the same as turning up and down this level control. While the sustain phase is occurring, in other words, while I've got that key held down, those two actions are equivalent. Now, how do we get to this sustain level? Well, it's not instantaneous. We go through two other processes called the attack and decay. Best way to visualize this is to say, the moment you press the key, you start the attack phase and you start from zero. From that moment until a period of time specified by the attack level, as I'm turning this, moving this slider up and down, you can see there's a time. That's the amount of time it's gonna take us to reach maximum volume. So now that I've increased attack to over four seconds, when I press a key, it's gonna slowly fade in. From this point, it's gonna go through the decay phase and we decay down to the sustain point. We don't decay down to zero, we decay down to the sustain point. If I set the sustain point to zero and give us some decay, we're gonna go up through the attack phase, down through the decay phase, and eventually we will arrive at zero because that's what I've just set. Here we go. So we're getting louder during the attack phase, momentarily hit maximum, and then immediately start fading away and eventually hit zero. And now it doesn't matter. I've still got the key held down. You can see in the virtual keyboard, but it doesn't matter because we're at this sustain zero level. Now I'm just holding this key down and I'll bring the sustain level back up to show you that the synthesizer is still making sound. It's just being controlled by that sustain level. When I let the key go, we enter the final phase of the, of the um, envelope, which is called the release phase. And this is denoted by R. And this is how long it's gonna take for the note to fade away to zero once we've got to this stage, once we've got to basically the release phase. So I'm gonna let the key go. And now we're gonna start fading away. I've actually set a pretty big release there, haven't I? Eight seconds. It's gonna take eight seconds to descend to zero. Attack, decay, sustain, release, ADSR the most common type of envelope you'll find in synthesizers. Just a quick mention, you heard um, the effect during that demonstration then. The decay phase of this synthesizer 
um, imposes itself on any change that you make to the sustain level dynamically. So if I set the sustain to maximum, press a key, we'll let the sound get to maximum volume. There it is. I'm going to turn the slider all the way down to zero very quickly. And it slowly fades away. It's basically the, the decay time that's acting like a shock absorber or a buffer. If I turn the decay down to zero and turn sustain all the way up again, it'll be instantaneous. There we go. So we have this kind of internal buffering in changes to the sustain level that it does go back through the decay phase again. That's quite unusual. The next command along is called key follow. What this basically does is it takes the concept of the ADSR envelope. How long do you want to perform this operation? And it effectively compresses it. The further up the keyboard you go, the envelope's going to get shorter and shorter. And this replicates many real world instruments where their entire envelope, the time it takes for that thing to happen, gets shorter and shorter as you go up in pitch. So it emulates that effect. I want sustain at zero for this demonstration. So it's just going to go up to maximum and back down again. And the whole thing took maybe five seconds. Now I'll press the highest note on my keyboard. And that didn't take five seconds, did it? So as we come down, the envelope gets longer and longer. As I say, replicating the real world, that's what happens. Uh, in, in the real world, very short, very high pitched instruments generally have much smaller envelopes than bassier ones. Then we've got velocity sensitivity. At the moment, there is no velocity sensitivity. I turn that up to maximum and I'm just going to give myself an instant sound here. So I set the attack to zero and the sustain to maximum, which, may, which means the moment I press a key, you're going to hear it instantly. And then when I let it go, it'll disappear again. I'll press it very softly very quiet. I'll press it harder. Pretty obvious that's velocity sensitivity. And we'll turn that back down to a more reasonable level. So it's nice to have a little bit, but you don't want to make it so that it's actually difficult to generate sound out of the thing. That's a reasonable range between hitting a soft key and a loud key. Okay, so if envelope two is taking care of the volume of the synthesizer for us, what's envelope one there for? Well, that's a general modulation envelope, and it's capable of being assigned to multiple different sources. In order to describe one of those examples, we're going to move over to the VCF or the voltage controlled filter next. We'll have a chat about this, and then we'll hook up uh, envelope number one. So basically what the filter does, I want you to have a look in the spectrum analyzer below, is attenuate or cut away either low frequencies, high frequencies, or a combination of the two. And those three options are selected with this toggle button here. LPF stands for low pass filter, which means as things stand at the moment, the filter's going to throw away high frequencies the more we ask the more work we ask it to do. So let's play a note. You see a fairly even distribution of frequencies. You always get this tailing off. It's higher frequencies basically have less energy than low frequencies. So you're always going to get this slope. But as I pull the frequency cut off down, all of the high frequencies are going to disappear. The rate of 24 decibels per octave. So for every octave that we come down in frequency, let's say from 10k down to 5k, it's going to be a 24 decibel attenuation. Now 24 decibels per octave filter is about as steep as you get. You very rarely get more than that. Because if 6 decibels represents a doubling of volume, 24 decibels is the very steep curve that you're seeing represented in the spectrum analyzer. All of those upper frequencies getting attenuated quite dramatically. If we switch to high pass filter mode, the opposite is going to happen. Now we're going to attenuate or throw away low frequencies and the frequency slider operates in the opposite direction. So down at zero, it's having no effect. And then as we introduce the cutoff, you can see us throwing away those lower frequencies and how brutal that is to the sound, how important low frequencies are to the kind of the depth and meat of the sound. It gets really thin and raspy very quickly. BPF stands for band pass, and it's pretty obvious what this is going to do. Have a look at it in the analyzer. It's throwing away 
uh, frequencies below and above this specified middle point, this cutoff point. So the cutoff is always the, the, the point around which the filter is focused. And then it's a question of whether or not we're throwing away stuff below, above or both. Now this cutoff point has another purpose as well, because we can attenuate the frequencies around that point and we accomplish that through the resonance control. So as I increase resonance, you'll see a spike begin to appear. Just get my levels a little bit more reasonable, a bit too quiet there. Okay, here we go. So you can see this spike getting steeper and steeper. And eventually, that fairly unpleasant sound up at the top of the resonance slider is a thing called self-oscillation where the, the synthesizer starts to generate, the filter circuit of the synthesizer starts to generate its own tone. Now, it doesn't matter what note I play on the keyboard, you're always gonna get that sharp spike at exactly that frequency. So let's get it self-oscillating again, and I'll press a range of keys over the keyboard, and you'll see this spike where my mouse is, regardless of what key I press on the keyboard. It's a little bit difficult to see there, I'll just bring my mouse down. It's always centered around that point. And this note here is one that's sympathetic with that cutoff. In other words, the note itself is generating a pitch, a strong harmonic at exactly the same frequency as the cutoff. And that's why I'm not going to press it again because it's quite unpleasant. You do get these very intense additional harmonics, something like a, like a wolf tone um, that you'd hear in the acoustic world, these really kind of quite painful extra harmonics. So let's pull that back because we don't want that anymore. Generally speaking, I tend to stay away from self-oscillation because it, it's a bit, you know, stabs you in the face. The resonance itself is great. If we give us a decent amount of resonance and then do a filter sweep, It's the resonance that's giving us that intensity, that sharp spike as we travel through the frequency range. If I pull resonance right down, still sounds good, but nowhere near as interesting. Okay, so that's the basic functionality of the filter. Then we can apply an envelope to it. So imagine this filter doing this cool stuff, but then we've got this concept of envelopes having a beginning, a journey, a middle, and then an end. We tie those two concepts together with the envelope slider. So we're, it's still inside the VCF module here, but now I'm gonna use the envelope slider to apply an envelope to the filter. Now this, these couple of buttons in the middle specify which envelope is gonna do the work. As you can see, we could use the, um, the volume envelope, envelope two, but I'm gonna leave it to envelope one to do this job so that envelope two can take care of generating the sound. And at the moment you can see straight on, straight off, a really simple job. But then the filter envelope from envelope one has an opportunity to do something a little bit more expressive. So let's dial in an attack and decay and we'll sustain down to zero. So nice, simple kind of triangular shape we're drawing with the envelope. And then we'll dial that in to the filter and we're gonna get this up through the attack phase. We're gonna peek out and then come back through the decay phase. And then we'll settle down, we can heighten the resonance if we want to see where the cutoff has settled at our sustain point of zero. Now if I increase the sustain level now, we're gonna reintroduce some additional cutoff and pull it back down again. Generally speaking, you don't manipulate these controls dynamically when you're playing the instrument. You set the envelope and then you leave it to do that job and it's gonna do this much of the job. So if I pull the envelope control down to 50%, the, the maximum cutoff that we're gonna go through during that triangle is gonna be smaller. So the envelope is still doing exactly the same job. It's doing the same amount of work. Let's try to set it so that we don't actually reach the end of the frequency range. There we go. So previously we'd gone way past. That delay was because the, the frequency had gone past the maximum possible cutoff and then it was coming back down. This time we never got to that maximum. And now we 
ticked out at about 9K there. I'm going to skip over LFO today because we've not dealt with the low frequency oscillators yet. There's an extra module that can apply additional modulation, but we're not going to worry about that today. Now this keyboard slider here is a little bit similar to key follow, but it's not talking about the application of an envelope. What this keyboard slider is going to do is um, increase the cutoff proportionately as we go up the keyboard. So again, if we have a look at the, like the default or native frequency of the cutoff itself, 1419, I'm going to disengage this envelope so we've got a static filter. I'll play the lowest note on the keyboard. And here is our spike. 1419 is round about where my mouse is and you can see clearly where it's peaking. If I play a note two octaves higher, that frequency cutoff is still at the same point. But now if I introduce keyboard tracking into the VCF, the lowest note's still going to be centered at the same point. So this synthesizer is based on the lowest note of the keyboard here. Let's call it C1 for the sake of argument. And there it is. But if I now play that note two octaves higher, the cutoff frequency is all the way up here. So the higher the notes that I play, the cutoff frequency is being pushed higher and higher into the frequency range. So a combination of those two sliders together, the envelope and the keyboard, have a slightly faster attack. You can hear all of those cutoffs dynamically tracking the keyboard. It just makes the filter feel a lot more real, a lot more organic, because the notes that you're playing have now got a cutoff that's got some sort of resemblance, some sort of relationship uh, to the underlying frequency rather than this completely static filter that's always um, accentuating exactly the same frequency. It doesn't make much sense really if you think about it. The keyboard is a chromatic tool so just slewing the frequency slightly with this keyboard control does make it feel more organic, more natural. The final thing to look at today is one extra feature we've got in envelope one. We have a polarity switch. So everything that we've described so far has been modulation in the positive territory. We've gone from zero up to a maximum and then back down again. But I can flip the polarity of envelope one. So let's take the keyboard back out to simplify matters, bring the envelope back in. So now with exactly the same envelope, just with its polarity flipped, instead of the filter going up and then coming back down, it's gonna go in the opposite direction. It's gonna start out where it would natively have been and then get duller and duller. It's basically gonna travel in the opposite direction and then we'll come back up. So let's have a note. I'll play a note quite high because this is gonna make a very dull sound. So we disappeared beyond the audible range, it basically threw all the frequencies away, and then only when it came back did the sound reappear. So just bear in mind that voltages can be negative as well. It's very rare for envelopes to deal with negative voltages, but with your polarity switch, you do have that option. And that'll do us for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.